All right, let's uh, let's do a new example. Um, consider a, a clinical trial. Um, we have 12 patients put in the treatment group. We have uh, six patients put in the control group. Um, we observe that um, of the 12 treatment patients, 10 have a favorable reaction, good news. Um, and of the six patients in the control group, two have a favorable reaction. Um, so again, this is maybe some nice practice. Um, you know, you should hopefully be comfortable translating the words here into a table. The next slide, you'll see what the table looks like. Um, but it might be worth pausing this video and then seeing whether or not you can sketch that table on your own. Um, it may or may not be um, a little bit old hat at this point. So here's here's our table, right? So I took I took the the scenario. Um, that I described in the previous slide and, and put it here in this sort of table. Now, how how could we analyze this, um, right? So up till now, up till now, we've talked about these two chi-square tests, the Pearson chi-square test, the randomization chi-square test. Notice both of those tests require the expected cell counts to be five or more. Is that satisfied right now in this example? And the answer is no. Agreed? A nice little trick. We do not have to compute the expected cell count for every one of these cells. We only have to do the expected cell count for the cell that's going to have the smallest expected cell count. Agreed? Because if the smallest expected cell count is above 5, well, that means they're all above 5, so we're good. And if the smallest expected cell count is below five, well, in theory, they're all supposed to be above five. So if even one of them is below five, then we need some sort of alternative. So how do I know which one of these four is gonna have the smallest expected cell count? Well, it's, it's, it's essentially, right, the, the expected cell count is the row total times the column total over the overall total. So all I do is I look for the smallest row total. That's row two, which has a row total of six. And I look for the smallest column total. That's column two, which has a column total of six. So that means that bottom right cell, right, the one that has the number four is going to have the smallest expected cell count. And so I could calculate that expected cell count. I do it formally on the next slide, um, but I'm talking us through it now where we can actually see the table. And so the expected cell count for the, the control group that had a negative reaction is going to be 6 times 6 divided by 18. So that's going to be 2. So we're out of luck, right? We have an expected cell count less than 5, quite a bit less than 5. Which means that, right, the approximations... Right, these chi-squared approximations that um, that the functionality of our previous chi-squared tests rely upon are not satisfied. There's also our stuff from last week or last lecture, right? Our stuff from last week or last lecture, um, right? Maybe the difference in proportions, for example. But I believe that we had the rule of thumb for the difference of proportions that... Um, I think all our actual cells had to be like eight or more. And of course, that's not satisfied here either. So the, so the problem is because we have a relatively small sample size, the tests that we've talked about thus far are unjustified. So let me summarize what I've just said in the next slide. And then we'll go ahead and think about what we might want to do about it. So here we go. I already said this while we were looking at our tables. Can we use either of our chi-square tests? No. The expected cell count for that cell 2, 2, right? Lower right-hand corner is 2. Um, and we also can't do the difference of proportions. So, oh no, what do we do? Well, our third test to the rescue. This is, this is why we're going to learn about something called the Fisher's exact test. Now, the Fisher's exact test... Um, it's kind of a spin-off of the randomization test that we just learned. The Fisher's exact test uses the same sort of assumptions, row totals fixed, column totals fixed, 
and observes that N11 follows a hypergeometric distribution. However, it then says, why assume, why build a test statistic that is approximately chi-squared when we know that N11 follows exactly a hypergeometric distribution, at least under the null hypothesis? Right. In olden days with low computational power, right, these approximations were easier to calculate. But with modern day computers calculating something based off a non-approximated distribution, as long as we know what it is, in this case the hypergeometric distribution, is actually not that big a deal at all. Our computers, our modern day computers, can handle this very easily. So why bother with an approximation when we know the exact distribution? Right? As in Fisher's exact test. So let's see how we do that because it is a little bit unusual. Up until now, anytime we've calculated a p-value, it's been using a continuous distribution, right? The normal distribution is continuous. Um, the t distribution is continuous. The f distribution is continuous. The chi-square distribution is continuous. Hypergeometric is discrete. We've never calculated a p-value. Um, at least not in classes that I've taught you, um, using a using a discrete distribution. So let's kind of see how that how that works. Now, considering the row and column totals fixed, right? That's kind of one of kind of like the the assumptions or the setup for this randomization, and it's part of how we rationalize a hypergeometric distribution. Considering the row and column totals fixed. What are the possible values for a random variable in 1, 1? Well, here's our table, right? And so think about what goes in there. It's tempting to say that the values could be 0 through 12. But that's not true. Do you agree with that? Because what would happen if we put a zero in that upper left-hand cell? If we put a zero in that upper left-hand cell, well, the lower left-hand cell has to be a 12, agreed? Because that column total is 12. But if the lower left-hand cell is 12, well, that's exceeding the row total, which is six, agreed? And of course that can't happen. So it can't be zero, and same rationale, it can't be one, it can't be two, right? We eventually get to six. It can be six, right? So if I have six in the upper left-hand cell, I can fill in the rest of the table. If I have if I have six in the, uh, in the upper left, then I'm going to have six in the upper right, six in the lower left, zero in the lower right. And then I'll leave it to you, right? Put a seven in the upper left and fill in the rest of the table, right? It's good practice. Put an 8 in the upper left, fill in the rest of the table, right? Verify for yourself that I could plug in a 6, a 7, all the way to 12 and fill in that table correctly. But if I put in a 5, it's going to give me a broken table. So, so we have to be a little bit careful when we think about, like, what are the values that, that N11, right, the cell count in our upper left-hand cell can actually take. It takes a little bit of thought. So once we know the possible values that it takes, 6 through 12, we can calculate the probability of each of these values. Well, how do we calculate those probabilities? We calculate them, right, knowing that these things follow a hypergeometric distribution under all our assumptions in the null hypothesis. And, and so how do we find hypergeometric distributions? Well, if you've taken STAT 505, you actually learn how to calculate it by hand. The actual formula for calculating these probabilities is on the inside cover of most mathematical statistics textbooks. It's a bit tedious to calculate by hand. So you could calculate it in R using the dhyper function, right? Hyper is in hypergeometric, D as in the, the density or distribution. In SAS, we can calculate it by using the PDF function. Remember, in SAS, this has to be embedded within a data step. So the PDF function with the keyword hyper.
So that x equals 8 for both of those things, right? In, in both of these examples, I'm trying to calculate um, the probability of, of the upper left-hand cell count being 8. So the first, the first value in there, that first number, that 8, is what I want the probability of. The next thing we have to be aware of, hypergeometric distribution actually has three parameters, three parameters. So like the normal distribution has two, right? It has the mean and the standard deviation. To calculate any normal probability, we need to know the mean and the standard deviation of that normal distribution. Similarly, to calculate any hypergeometric probability, we need to know, right, the M and the N and the K. Now, what these three parameters represent right, is a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Again, if you've had STAT 505, you're, you know what those three parameters are. If you haven't had STAT 505, I think it's too much of a digression to go into it. Although, again, you could, you could Google it and find out for yourself. It's not, it's not that difficult. Now, I, I do want to say that you can define these three parameters in different ways. And so it turns out that R and SAS define the three parameters in different ways. I mean, there's always going to be three parameters. There's, excuse me, no way around that. But how we define what those three parameters represent can be done in a few different ways. So unfortunately, R and SAS define those parameters a little bit differently, which is why the inputs of those two functions look a little bit different. Nonetheless, all right, I encourage you to, to try it out yourself. Despite the different inputs, you'll get the same probability. And I believe that probability is on the next slide. So, so put that in R, put that in, in SAS to ask it what's the probability of that upper left-hand cell being 8. And you should get, um, I think it's actually like 0.3999 or something like that, which I rounded up to 0 0.40. So you could then plug in, right, x equals 6 and x equals 7 and x equals 9 and x equals 10 x equals 11 x equals 12 that's what i did for us and so these are the possible values for the upper left hand cell and then those are the probabilities right all probabilities add up to one which these may or may not a little bit of rounding going on so if they don't add up exactly to one um right it's just uh it's just a rounding issue in fact i guess looking at the rightmost column they won't add up exactly to one right because a little bit of rounding um but, but those are the true probabilities uh, rounded uh, to four decimal places. So now that we have the probabilities, we can now calculate the p-values. So let's go ahead and see how we do that. Let's start with a one-sided p-value. I, I know in practice we typically do two-sided p-values. But this is almost like conceptual training wheels. It'll be a little bit easier to kind of start thinking about this in the one-sided case because you'll see the two-sided case is like a little bit unusual. Um, whereas I think the one-sided the one-sided um, way of calculating a, a discrete p-value is probably a little bit more intuitive to us. So in this case, the reasonable one-sided hypothesis test would be that the treatment is more effective. Right, so one side is either we're going to say it's more or less effective. We probably would be hoping it's more effective. So that would be what we'd be interested in testing. Being more effective means that it has more positive outcomes. So that means that we would be interested in calculating what's the probability of seeing as many cured people in our treatment group as we have just observed or more. Something as good as what's just been observed or more good <laughs> or gooder. So remember, this was our original table. This was the observed data. So we observed 10 out of 12 getting cured. What's going to be the one-sided p-value? The one-sided p-value is going to be the probability of seeing 10 or more people see or benefit from a favorable reaction. So our p-value is the probability that N11, that upper left-hand cell, is greater than or equal to 10. That's the probability that it equals 10 plus the probability equals 11 plus the probability equals 12. I can get those three probabilities from my previous slide, right? I had that previous slide where I enumerated all six probabilities and determined that that's 0.0574, which in this case is borderline non-significant, right? So 
we would say that um, right the usual 0.05 significance level there is not enough evidence to conclude that there's any difference between treatment and control Well, what about two-sided? Well, how do we typically define a two-sided distribution? We typically des describe a two-sided distribution as what's the probability of seeing an outcome as unlikely as the one we've just observed, as extreme as the one we've just observed, or more extreme slash more unlikely. Now, in this example, we observed a value of 10, and that value of 10 had a probability of 0.0533. That means that we want to sum over all possibilities whose probability is less than or equal to 0.0533. So let's revisit those probabilities. There they are. The, the p-value, the two-sided p-value is the probability of seeing an outcome as, as rare as the one observed or more rare, as unlikely as the one observed or more unlikely. So that's gonna be what? It's gonna be outcomes 10, 11, 12, and then look at the rest of them or any of those other ones less than 0.0533. Aha, yes, the, the, the probability of getting a six is just 0.0498. So I'll summarize this on the next slide, but our two-sided p-value is going to be the probability of 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 6. Our two-sided p-value is just like I said, probability n11 equals 6 plus the probability n11 equals 10 plus the probability equals 11 plus the probability equals 12. Plugging all those numbers in, I get 0.1071. All right. Um, it's one of those things like conceptually it's the same. That's how we did it before. We've always kind of said it's the probability of seeing something as unlikely or more unlikely, something as extreme or more extreme. It's just because of the nature of um, because of the nature of our discrete distribution, we have to sort of calculate or compute that a little differently. Now, how do we get SAS to do this for us? We can get the Fisher's exact test as actually part of the slash chi-square option. So if you actually go back to some previous slides, you'll see the Fisher's exact output there. We just weren't emphasizing it at the moment because we, we, hadn't, we hadn't been introduced to that test. The Fisher's exact output has one-sided and two-sided p-values, as well as the probability of the observed outcome, which SAS calls a table probability. So here's our code, right? There's our, our data set. Um, there's our proc freak. Order equals data, right? So that's, that's, that's saying order my rows and tables based on the order they appear in my data set. Use that chi-square option to get my Fisher's exact test. All right, and so here we are, right? Um, if I go to the very bottom, Notice, actually notice this, uh, in between um, the statistics for table of group by result and Fisher's exact test, look how nice this is of SAS, right? SAS actually gives us a warning. That's how, that's how sort of widely used the rule of thumb is for expected cell counts of five or more. It's like programmed into like SAS's core. SAS observes itself, hey, Three out of four, 75% of your cells have an expected cell count less than five. Your chi-square test might not be valid, right? SAS warns us that there might be trouble. And of course, that means that we should focus on the Fisher's exact test. We focus on the Fisher's exact test. We have the one-sided p-value. That's the 0 0.0573. We also have our two-sided p-value. That's the 0.1070. I'm not entirely sure why SAS reports that table probability. Maybe it's nice to know. So again, that table probability is the probability of observing exactly a 10 in that upper left-hand cell. Unfortunately, from what I see, it actually just creates more trouble than it's worth because, right, when I do a test or a homework assignment, it just creates confusion. And sometimes students write down that 0.0533 as the, as the, as the relevant p-value. 
the two-sided p-value, and it is not, right? So never write down that 0.0533 as a p-value, as a two-sided p-value. It is not. It actually, to me, it ends up just being like a red herring. And and just it just kind of provides a, an extra opportunity for us to make a mistake. Personally, I kind of wish it didn't report that table probability, at least not by default. You know, maybe there's an option that allows us to ask for it. So don't get confused, right? When, you, when you're reading that output, the one that we're interested in is that two-sided prob less than or equal to P. Ha! Check! Three down, just two more to go, right? So now all we have to talk about is McNamara's test, which we're, we're gearing up to talk about now, and then we'll wind things down with a goodness of fit test. All right, so here's our, um, here's our situation, here's our scenario, here's our example. Some nameless presidential candidate gives a fiery speech on immigration. Pollsters are curious as to whether or not the speech has changed the minds of the American people with respect to this presidential candidate. And with that in mind, they poll 100 voters. 68 of these voters had a negative opinion of the candidate before and after the speech, so they didn't change their mind. Three had a negative opinion that turned positive. They liked that speech. They said, you know what? You're preaching to the choir. One had a positive opinion. They liked that person, and then it turned negative. Maybe they were turned off by the fiery speech. Maybe it wasn't fiery enough for them. And then 29 had a positive opinion uh, that stayed positive. And so our goal statistically is to see if opinions significantly change. Now, again, what does this mean? It, it does, I mean, obviously some people change their mind. We, we see that, right? We see four people change their mind. So what do we mean by that? We kind of mean like, does the overall percentage of people that favored the candidate, right? Presumably like the percentage of the American voting population that had a, a positive opinion, is it is it still the same after that speech, right? And so that could be that, you know, that a non-significant number of like the whole country changed. It could even be that maybe a lot of people changed their opinions positive, but it was offset by an equally large number that changed their opinion in, in the opposite direction, right? But our, our ultimate goal is just, was the percentage or was the proportion of voters that had a positive opinion of this candidate the same before and after the speech? And so let's get to it, right? Let's do some statistics. Who's ah? So here is, uh, here is the information from the previous slide. Summarized in a data set, we have the before opinion, the after opinion, and how many people fall into each of these different groups. Uh, just a chi-square test, right? So, um, you know, I'll throw it in, uh, proc freak, look at my expected cell counts to make sure that I have um, good expected cell counts. If not, no big deal, NBD, I'll just use the uh, Fisher's exact test. Actually... I have a question for you um, before we dig deeper. What do you expect to happen? Do you expect us to see, do you expect our p-value to be large or small? We had 100 people, right? Only four of them changed their mind, right? So 96 people stuck to their guns. 96 people were intransigent. They, they, they didn't change. Only four people changed, and of course, right, some of them changed in different directions, so they kind of offset each other. So so my expectation is what? My expectation is that this speech didn't really change, like, the, the opinions of the American voting population, right? That it didn't change in what we would call a significant way. Do you agree or disagree with that expectation? Hopefully, Hopefully you can kind of see where I'm coming from. So I'm expecting a large p-value, maybe 0 0.50, 0 0.60, 0 0.70, because very, very few people actually change their minds, right? 
So let's go ahead and, uh, and verify our expectations. All right, so, so there's, our, um, there's our results. Um, check those expected cell counts. Expected cell counts is the, the second number in the cell, so the 48.505. So that's good. 22.495, that's good. 20.495, that's good. 9.505, all our expected cell counts are good. So we can actually just use the chi-square test. And so I expect to see a large P... Huh? That's weird. I was expecting large, and instead it's what? It's like astronomically small. Astronomically small. I expected a p-value like, like 0 0.70, 0 0.80, and what am I getting? I'm getting a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. That's saying that there is extremely strong evidence that that the American population changed its mind, but I just don't see that when I look at the data. What the cut the? This is extremely weird. Maybe like there's a virus or something in my computer that's corrupting SAS's calculations. I, I don't know. Using a Pearson's chi-square test, right? We checked the expected cell counts to make sure it was justified to do that. We observe a p-value of less than 0.001, which is highly significant. That's so weird. That's so bizarre. Ah, oh, blows my mind. It makes me eat my brain. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Left is right and up is down. What is going on? Well, what is our what is our chi-square test testing? What probabilities is our chi-square test comparing? Remember, the chi-square test is comparing those conditional row probabilities of the two different rows. It could be of either outcome. Let's um, I guess let's focus on like positives. Um, let's be, let's be positive people. Let's be optimistic. So. If we look at these these row percentages, what do we have? Well, the row percentage for the first row is 4.23, and the row percentage for the second row is 96.67, right? That, it, those are drastically different, agreed. 4% compared to 96, 97%, that is, that is incredibly different. So when I look at it as like I'm comparing those two percents, then yeah, a, a, a small p-value, a large test statistic is not surprising in the slightest. But is comparing those two percents what I actually want to be doing? That is, in this particular context, I'm not even sure that like those row percents make any type of like reasonable, intuitive sense. They're certainly not what we're interested in. We're interested in seeing whether or not opinions before and after changed. So so what are we in, what are we actually comparing? We're actually comparing marginal probabilities, agreed? That is, if we're we're comparing the percentage of people that had a positive opinion before the speech. And if I look all the way over, that's 29.7%. 29.7% of the American, well, of our sample, which we're going to infer as an estimate that 29.7% of the sample had a positive opinion of the candidate before their speech, and compare that to the column probability, 31.68%, right? And those two percentages are very close to one another, right? That agrees with our original intuition that opinions haven't changed very much. So what the chi-square test is comparing is 4% to 96%, when the, in reality what we want to be comparing is that 29.7% to that 31.68%. So how? How do we do that? Well, as you might have guessed, the McNamara's test is how we're going to do it. Enter. McNamara, our question of interest 
you know, it occurs to me, I actually do love statistical history. For whatever strange reason, I have never, I've never looked up any interesting facts about Net McNamara. Oh, maybe that could be like a, wouldn't that be cool? Like an extra credit question on an exam or maybe a homework assignment. Maybe you go out and do your own research to find out more about this enigmatic McNamara. I'm actually not even 100% sure that he is a he. Yeah, that's 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 my own gender bias, right? Sneaking through. Could be could be female, could be male. I shouldn't be making assumptions. We shouldn't be making assumptions. I don't know who Mr. slash Mrs. slash Dr. slash Sir McNamara is. Might be interesting to find out. So that could be something fun you can do when you finish this lecture. And, and if you find anything cool, let me know. I, I would love to know about it. So anyways, back to McNamara's test. Our question of interest is not one that's answered by the chi-squared. And it's a nice lesson to us. We never want to blindly apply statistical techniques. Always, right? That's what separates us as actual statisticians from practitioners that are that are using statistics is we understand all these sort of underlying things. And right, under, understanding the underlying structures helps us avoid easy mistakes like the one we just almost made. So, so how does this McNamara's test work? McNamara's test is traditionally associated with something called a matched pairs design. In a matched pairs design, each measurement, right, each little observation, each number in a cell, is a pair of related individuals on which we've measured the same variable, right? Same variable. So one thing about McNamara's test is that your row variable and your column variables are always the same, which they were in this example, right? Our row variable and column variable was an opinion and the opinion was either positive or negative, right? They differed because they, they were different points in time before and after, right, the speech. Contrast this to a chi-square test where we're generally measuring two separate variables on the same individual, right? So an observation in a chi-square test is usually, right, one individual with two pieces of information that we're recording on them. And a McNamara's test is usually a pair of individuals. And on each of those pairs, we're recording the same piece of information. So what are some other examples of, of a matched pair? Um, let's actually maybe start with that second bullet point. So, right, opinions are obtained from like a husband and wife. Husband and wife are the matched pair. Opinions are obtained um, from twins, right? Two different twins. So here, this idea of like a matched pair, I think is like pretty like, um, is like pretty explicit, right? So you have a husband and a wife, and there's four possibilities, right, of their opinion. The husband could have a favorable opinion, and the wife could have a favorable opinion. Husband could have a negative opinion. Wife could have a negative opinion. Husband could have favorable. Wife could be negative. Husband could be negative. Wife could be favorable, right? So any particular observation is actually, right, is actually related to a pair, a husband and wife duo, a husband and wife team or maybe twins, right? Also, right, we sometimes will do like chemical tests to like a left and right hand, to a left and right eye, to a left and right ear. That is sometimes, right, we pair we, we pair people, um, right, maybe, maybe do a treat, like an actual treatment to the left hand, a control treatment to the right hand and see how they work to like kind of, um, to rule out any sort of outside factors, right? Because it makes a little bit of sense, right? That is, if you if you put a treatment, um, if you apply treatment to one person and a control to a different person, right? They have different immune systems, and there's all kinds of these other variables. If we apply treatment and control to the same person, maybe their left hand, right hand, right? Well, then you know, since it's the same person, they have the same immune system, right? It kind of rules out some of these confounders. Case control studies, right, in a more clinical trial type framework fall into this thing, where often, right, you'll you'll put someone in a treatment group, and what you'll try to do, 
is you'll try to find someone that matches them as closely as possible in, in, in important demographic categories and give them the control, the control treatment, give them the placebo, sorry. So, right, if you, if you, if you give a treatment to like a, like an, an old white male, you would then try to find another old white male to give the placebo to. And so now the, we would say these people are matched. And so they're a matched pair. The example we did is a little bit more abstract, right? Because we're almost like thinking about a pair of people. I mean, it's really the same person, but it's that same person at two points of time, right? So, so it's the person before the speech and the person after the speech. They're the matched pair. And so what was the... What was the person before the speech's opinion paired with the person after the speech's opinion? So the one we did is a little bit more abstract, but nonetheless, right, can still fit into this kind of match pairs framework. Now notice in these cases, neither our row or column totals are fixed. So this is kind of like our third sort of possibility, right? Um, we kind of started this this class, the, the Pearson's chi-squared, as well as like those earlier like tests of like a difference in proportion. Those tests assume that the row totals are fixed, but the column totals are random. Then we talked about the randomization chi-square and and for the randomization chi-square, we said we kind of make these assumptions and we do this conditioning excuse me, so that the row and column totals are fixed. If just the row totals are fixed, we're working with binomial random variables. If the row and column totals are fixed, we're working with a hypergeometric distribution. And it turns out that if neither of these are fixed, and I do want you to think this through, like why this study design would be, right, a type of study design where the row and column totals would not be fixed, right? I, I sample a hundred um, married couples and I observe, right, what's their opinion about some presidential candidate. I ask the husband what he thinks, I ask the wife what she thinks, right? They could fall, that, that husband-wife pair could fall in any one of the four possibilities. And so we don't know, we don't know a priori, we don't know ahead of time, what the row totals and what the column totals are going to be. This type of distributional situation, this type of, of probabilistic structure is referred to as a multinomial distribution, which again, if you've taken STAT 505, you're going to be familiar with that. If you haven't taken STAT 505, don't worry about it. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out there um, for us to kind of be aware of, but I certainly don't expect you to do any calculations or have any type of deep understanding of that multinomial distribution. So, breaking it down, we conceptualize the four possible outcomes from our two by two table as coming from a multinomial distribution. And ultimately we wanna test what? Ultimately we wanna test, right, whether or not these marginal probabilities are the same. Is pi one plus, that's the, that's the, that's the marginal row probability, is that equal to or not equal to, right, pi plus one, that's the marginal column probability. So that's what's being compared. And we could do a lot of derivations of like the underlying calculations that requires a lot of kind of 505 type theory. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump right to having SAS do it for us. So we have SAS provide or, or perform McNamara's test by doing the agree option in the table statement. And so there it is. There's our McNamara's test. Our test statistic is one, the loneliest number in the world. And the p-value associated with that test statistic is 0.3173. So well above 0.05, indicating right that we do not think there, there, there's not evidence that right that this speech has changed the opinions of the overall voting public which agrees with what our original expectations were regarding this data. 
Yeah, so just to put it in words, to write it out for us, our p-value is 0.3173, much larger than the usual 0.05 threshold. We fail to reject the percentage of positive opinions or the proportion of voters who had a positive opinion after the speech is not significantly different than it was before the speech. Now, interestingly, our textbook, which which includes a lot of like sample size rule of thumbs, uh, did not put a rule of thumb uh, recommendation in, in the textbook. And I did some searching of my own. I, I couldn't really come across one. Um, so my suggestion would be playing it safe and using the exact test statistic. So there's just like, there's, like the Fisher's exact test is like a like a, um, a low sample size analog of the randomization test, there is a small sample size analog to McNamara's test, a sort of exact version of McNamara's test. McNamara's test uses an approximation, um, an approximate distribution, um, where you, whereas just like before, you could actually use the exact distribution of a multinomial distribution to get exact p-values. And I would suggest doing that um, anytime our expected cell counts are five or less. Um, and so you can get an exact test statistic, which is based off the multinomial distribution and its p-values um, by putting the following statement. So this is a whole new line and it's the exact statement. There's actually a whole bunch of options for the exact statement. This, I believe, is one of the newer um, upgrades in, in more recent versions of SAS. Maybe new as of like version 9.3, maybe 9.2, um, is the exact statement in Proc Freak. And so you can put a lot of different stuff after the exact statement. Uh, McNamara's is one of them. So that's what the code looks like. Notice it's its own line. And then notice now it adds an exact line. So the p-value before was asymptotic, right? That's that's assuming this approximate distribution, which assumes a large sample size that may or may not be true. And so, um, right, if we want to use the exact multinomial distribution, the p-value is going to be 0 0.6250, right? Larger, and, and we might say different, but both of them leading to the same conclusion, which is often the case. Whew. All right, four down, check. One more to go. So I'll leave it to you whether or not you want to pause this video and take a breather. I had actually thought that I was going to do so. However, I'm still on lockdown, so I can't go out and get ice cream. The only thing I could really do is go out and kill lanternflies, which are currently infesting both my front and backyard. But I have to admit, it doesn't sound particularly exciting. I'm more excited to talk about statistics, so I'm going to go ahead and keep narrating. The last test that we have to talk about is something called a goodness of fit test, um, or a chi-square goodness of fit test. Mechanically, it, it, it works the same as the Pearson's chi-square test, right? I said that we see this formula, the, the formula for the Pearson's chi-square test. I said it occurs quite frequently, and here's a second situation where we're using that same sort of formula. And that same sort of formula is that observed minus expected squared over expected. Where the observed cell counts, right, is just what we see in our data. Expected cell counts are, um, right, well, we'll see how they're calculated. We, and we, we calculate this observed minus expected squared over expected for every cell. We sum those results up. That gives us a, um, a test statistic, which we could use to test that the probability distribution of a sample is the same or different than some predetermined set of probabilities. So, right, one thing to emphasize now, and I think I emphasize it more in the next slide, the goodness of fit test, unlike all our other ones, is actually focusing on just a single variable we're looking at the probability distribution of a single variable and testing whether or not the observed data um, seems, seems um, consistent 
with some predetermined set of probabilities. Now, this test statistic, when we compute it, assuming we have a large enough sample, what, what's the rule of thumb for a large enough sample? Well, that's going to be an expected cell count of five or more. If we have that, we can assume it follows a close enough to chi-squared um, distribution. Now, remember, a chi-squared distribution has degrees of freedom associated with it. So what are the degrees of freedom? The degrees of freedom are k minus p minus 1, where k is the number of categories or outcome of the variable we're interested in, and p is the number of parameters that we needed to estimate. Now, p is often 0. We're going to actually do three examples of the goodness of fit test. I think in the first two examples, P is zero, and in the third example, P is one. Oh, all right, so here we go. So example one, a teacher writes an exam. She expects that 10% of her students will get an A, 20% of right all students who take this test will get a B, 40% of all students that will take this test will get a C, 20% of all students will get a D, 10% of all students will get an F. So, so this is kind of like these sort of population um, probabilities, these population proportions. She gives, it to, she gives a test to a class of 100 students and looks at the sample proportions. She's going to compare these sample proportions to the assumed population proportions. Now in this case, assuming a large enough sample size, her test statistic would follow an approximate chi-squared distribution with five minus one. Why five? Because there's five categories. A, B, C, D, F, right? Five categories. Five minus one. We're not, we are not estimating any parameters. So that P is zero. So I guess technically it's five minus zero minus one gives us four degrees of freedom. Does that make sense? I'm kind of writing this example. I'm not actually not going to like dig in too deeply in this one. Just a, just a quick example, show us a type of situation this could be used in, and also give us an example of kind of how these degrees of freedom are calculated. Here's a second example that we'll drill in a little bit more deeply. So imagine that we sample 140 students. We ask them to look up, because I'm guessing most people don't know. I don't know the day of the week I was born on, at least. But we ask them to find out what day of the week they were born on. And our goal is to test whether or not um, births are evenly distributed throughout the seven days. So in this case, we have seven categories, seven days of the week. We have no parameters that are being estimated. And so the degrees of freedom of our test statistic will be 7 minus 1. That's 6 degrees of freedom. Now, let's look at the actual data. And then from that data, let's look at how we might calculate a, uh, a test statistic and consequent p-value. So here's our observed data. So 13 were born on Sunday, 15 on Saturday. 23 on Monday, 24 on Tuesday, so on and so forth. Actually does kind of agree. I'm wondering, I inherited this example, I admit, from the great Professor Rieger. I'm not sure if he, if he fabricated these numbers or actually got them somewhere. It does kind of look like it agrees with what I might expect, right? And that is that, um, that there's more births on weekdays than weekends. Um, Especially since I'm guessing, right, some people have their, their um, right, their birth induced. Some people have C-sections, right? And so C-sections, for example, tend to be scheduled on kind of, right, Monday through, well, apparently doctors like to take Fridays off, so maybe Monday through Thursday. Um, but let, let's see. So, I mean, the actual numbers, of course, are not evenly distributed. If they were perfectly evenly distributed, we have 20 in every category. Um, but are they so far away from this even distribution that we think that it it suggests that, in fact, 
the true underlying probabilities are are different than uh right essentially one seventh right we're basically saying that that the the population proportions would be one in seven and so we want to see whether or not we think that's true or consistent with our observed sample so how do we ask sas to do this right we ask sas to do this we have to first input our data right so there's our data and then we can actually run it using proc freak so again this is just a single variable so my table statement has just one variable and that's just the day variable which records the day of the week and then the test p so the test p is the actual um like the theoretical probability distribution i want to test against here it's essentially a uniform distribution so our null hypothesis is that you're just as likely to be born um, any day of the week, which means that you have a one in seven chance of being born any given day of the week. So the probability of being born on Sunday is one over seven, which I put that into a calculator is 0.14286. A little bit of rounding. And the probability of being born on Monday is also one out of seven, Tuesday one out of seven. So those are my theoretical probabilities. That's, that's what I think is happening. And so that's what I want to compare the sample data to. And so here's what my output looks like. Right? So I it SAS very nicely kind of lays out the days of the week, Sunday, Monday, all the way to Saturday. And it shows the observed percent and the expected percent, right? So it compares right it says well you're you think it's one out of seven it's 14 percent but the reality is nine percent were born on sunday you think 14 percent should have been born on monday in your sample it was 16 percent on tuesday you think it should be 14 percent in your sample it was 17 percent so on and so forth Right, we could use these. So remember, our test statistic is right: observed cell count minus expected cell count squared over expected cell count. Right, we could get the observed cell count by multiplying those percentages or probabilities by the number of observations in our sample that fall in that category. So, in this case, um, oh, sorry, not by that, by um, by the total number of uh, people in our sample. Right, so we had 140 people in our sample, so we would expect 14.29% of that 140 to be born on Sunday. And what we observed is, well actually SAS gives us what we observed. We observed 13 were born on Sunday, which is 9.29%. Um, so actually we can get the observed and expected numbers pretty easily from this table. So SAS gives us the observed. That's the 13, 23, 24, 20. And the expected, right, because it's a uniform distribution is pretty easy to calculate. That's just gonna be, we had 140 people. So we would expect 20 on Sunday, 20 on Monday, 20 on Tuesday. So if I wanted to calculate the test statistic by hand, right, I would have seven numbers that I'm adding up the first number would be 13 minus 20 squared over 20. The second number would be 23 minus 20 squared over 20 and so on. Now SAS does those calculations for us, gives us a test statistic of 7.5998, six degrees of freedom, right? Total number of categories, which is seven minus one and gives us a p-value of 0.2689. P-value of 0.2689, which is well above 0.05. So we're basically saying that our observed data is not significantly different than what we hypothesized. So there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that, that, the, that the day of a week someone is born is different than a uniform distribution, right? So, right, it seems to support the idea
that people are just as likely to be born any day of the week. All right, hopefully easy enough. Um, it's a little different than maybe what we've been exposed to, so it may or may not be worth going back and kind of thinking through that example one more time. Of course, as always, you can reach out to myself or some of our graduate assistants with questions. This third example is even a little bit more challenging. Um, I, I might put something like this on a... Um, on a homework question, I probably would not put something like this third example on a on a test question. It's a little bit, I, I think, especially if you have not had 505, it kind of pushes us a little bit more than I would be comfortable pushing us. Um, I, th I feel like it'd be a little unfair to expect you to do something like this if you haven't had 505, but the majority of you have had 505, so it should make sense to the majority of you. And those of you that have not, I do think it's still good for you to be exposed to this. So, um, slightly more complicated example of the goodness of fit test. A township wants to test whether the number of accidents at a particular intersection follows a Poisson distribution. So a Poisson distribution um, is another example of a discrete distribution. It's used a lot for count data. We want to count something. Like, for example, count the number of um, accidents at an intersection. They record the number of accidents over the course of 365 days. Now, the Poisson distribution, right, unlike the hypergeometric, hypergeometric had three parameters. The Poisson distribution has just a single parameter, lambda. And lambda is not known, which means that the township will need to estimate it. So, aha! Now we have an example where that P, right, in the degrees of freedom, K minus P minus 1, now we have an example where that P is something other than 0. Here our P will be 1. This is the type of situation where you would estimate a parameter. Now it's a STAT 506 result that lambda can be effectively estimated with the sample mean, right? Talked about MLE, MLEs, method of moment estimation in um, in STAT 506. You probably showed right that um, that that the MLE right um, for lambda is x bar, the sample mean. Now for this data, it's determined that the sample mean is 1.7. So we are going to estimate lambda using a sample mean of 1.7. That's an estimated parameter. Now, what does the observed data look like? The observed data looks like this. 50 of our 365 days were accident-free. 13.7% of the data. 100 days had just a single accident, 27.4% of the data. 150 days had two accidents, so I guess this is a, a somewhat treacherous intersection. That's 41% uh, of the data. And 65 days had three or more accidents. Three or more accidents. So we need to calculate Poisson probabilities to find the expected number of days that have any given result, right? So we have our observed probabilities. Those were in the previous slide, but right, we want we need to know what to compare those to, right? Our our underlying assumption is that it's coming from a Poisson distribution, but we need to figure out, okay, well then what are the probabilities that would that would be derived from a Poisson distribution? We could calculate we could calculate these probabilities in R or SAS. I find personally I find it easier to calculate probabilities in R. I find it awkward that SAS requires me to like embed these probabilities in like a data step and then do a proc print. Right? R I can just do it straight off the command line. So I used R to calculate these probabilities. And I, I show us how to do it in the next slide. 
You can use the dpoisse function in R, so the density, probability density or distribution of a Poisson random variable. So the probability of, of zero um, intersections, if we're assuming the number of intersections follows a Poisson distribution with a lambda of 1.7, that was our that was our estimated value. That probability is 18%. The probability of, of one accident is 31%. Probability of two accidents is 26%. And to find the probability of, of x greater than or equal to three, of being three or more, well here, right, the Poisson distribution takes value zero, one, two, three, four, all the way to infinity. So I have to use a trick to calculate the probability x is greater than or equal to three. That trick is that all probabilities sum up to one. So the probability x is greater than or equal to 3 is just 1 minus the probability equals 0, minus the probability equals 1, minus the probability equals 2. That should hopefully make sense to us. I mean, certainly if you've had stat 505, I, 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 it must. If you haven't had 505, it may or may not make sense. Again, as always, if it doesn't make sense, reach out to me. It is, it is a type, it, it is... Um, I would expect you to understand the logic that I'm using in that last bullet point, even if you have not had STAT 505. So if it's not clicking, it is something you should, you should try to remedy. So here's my data set as summarized in the previous slide. And right here I could calculate the test statistic. I have to put those... Um, Right, kind of the null hypothesis, the, the the hypothesized probabilities or proportions, which I calculated in R. Here's my output. I used the kind of ODS to make it look a little nicer in the previous one. I'm a little old fashioned. I actually tend to avoid using ODS output, so this is kind of like whatever the finest uh, the finest ASCII output that the 1980s have to offer us, um, which is what I'm more comfortable with. Um, but the information's the same, um, although it lacks that one little graph. I'm, I'm not sure how, how useful that particular graph was. Um, our test statistic we can see is 41.9. The p-value is less than 0. 0.0001. However, I should point out that SAS technically calculates that p-value incorrectly right SAS does not realize that when we came up with those test percentages the 18.27 the 31.06 then we came up with those test percentages that we use those using an estimated parameter so it does degrees of freedom as the number of categories 4 minus 1, but it should be the number of categories 4 minus 1 minus 1. The degrees of freedom should be 2. Now that really is not going to change the p-value much. And so if our p-value is very, very, very far from 0.05, then it's probably not a big deal in terms of making a conclusion. If we actually wrote the p-value down and reported the p-value, it would be wrong, so we would want to fix that. But it, usually changing the degree of freedom is not going to change the conclusion. Nonetheless, let's see how we could change that degree of freedom. So here, uh, just reiterating what I just said, the test statistic is 41.8904. However, SAS has calculated its p-value wrong because it's assumed that the test statistic has three degrees of freedom. Remember, we had to estimate lambda, which means our degrees of freedom should be two. You could also do it in R. Um, I just wanted to uh, be a little even-handed with my software use. Um, we, could, we could find the correct p-value here, some SAS code to do it. Um, so the CDF function for the chi-square gives all the area to the left. Remember, the p-value for a chi-square is going to be all the area to the right. So I have to do 1 minus to get the p-value. And then I, the test statistic was at 41.8904. Our correct degrees of freedom are 2. I put that in. I do a proc print. It actually shows the p-value is still less than 0.0001. So it's 
you know, it doesn't change the bounds, right? In this case, it was so small, SAS didn't give us an exact p-value, just gave us a bounds, and it still falls within those bounds. But nonetheless, right, I want to show us the correct way to do it. And on a homework or, or a test, I would expect you to do this correct calculation and not just blindly accept SAS's incorrect calculation. So our conclusion is we reject the null hypothesis, which means what? It means that there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the number of accidents at this intersection does not, right? We're rejecting that null hypothesis that it comes from a Poisson distribution. So we think it does not come from a Poisson distribution with a mean of 1.7.